Hi, and welcome to MentorCore. If you're new here, we're a community focused on helping people in the security, risk, and compliance fields grow their careers and leadership skills through mentoring. You can find more information about MentorCore at mentorcore.biz. I'm Dan Ayala, along with Lisa Beth Lentini Walker. Now, on to this week's discussion. Welcome to another MentorCore podcast. This week, I am so, so, so excited because we have Steph Cheetah. Now, not only is Steph one of my favorite people on the planet, but she also is the co-author of a, a book with me called Raise Your Game, Not Your Voice. But Steph is so much more than that. Um, Steph, I met probably a decade ago, and um, we instantly hit it off. Steph is a communicator par excellence. She also is someone who gives back so much in so many ways, but I don't want to steal her thunder. So let's start out by welcoming Steph and saying, Steph, like what got you here today and what are you doing right now? Hi guys. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, well, gosh, what got me here today? I mean, I, I spend, I've spent a lot of years in communications. Um, I sort of grew up in corporate communications in-house at several organizations for about 15 years. And a few years ago, decided to go out on my own and start my own communications consulting business called Cheetah Communications. And it's absolutely so much fun. Uh, we help small and mid-sized businesses and nonprofits build relationships by communicating well so that they can grow and do more good in the world. It's a blast. Oh, I love it. And I know that that's not the only thing you do. So one of the things that as a parent, I've been very excited about is you also run a business that is helps young people communicate kind of their why and who they are through essay writing for, for college. We sure do. It's so unbelievable that the same tools and tips and tricks that CEOs and celebrities use to launch products and promote movies absolutely works in the context of college admissions with high schoolers. And we just have a ton of fun working with that audience as well through our business called Minnesota College Essay Coach. Very cool. And we'll put links to all of this into the show notes so that everybody can, uh, can know where to find you. So Steph, one of the things that comes up a lot as we talk to security professionals, compliance professionals, and those that are so inwardly focused or that are downwardly focused in our own worlds doing the work that we do um, is the value of communication and some of the tough things that come along with getting started in that. What is important for somebody who may not be extroverted, may be focused on the work at hand to keep in mind when they're communicating with others that they work with or work or work for? Yes, I love this question so much. The first thing, the first rule of effective communication is to always start with your audience in mind. And it is not human nature to do this. Um, Lisa Beth, when we're talking, she and I are talking about our books, sometimes we laugh and say like, gosh, if we did this well, even us, you know, um, as people who write about and talk about this subject, if we did this well with our spouses, we would get our way a lot more at home, right? It's just not human nature to start with your audience in mind, but that makes for excellent communication, right? Like when do they need to get some information you have to communicate versus when do you wanna share it to check it off your list, right? What do they care about in a message versus what you're trying to convey? And yes, you need to get your points across too, but if you can do it from their lens and really try to put yourself in their shoes, yes, you will get through so much more often the noise that they're uh, experiencing in their daily lives and really speak to their needs. I, I think the biggest mistake with communication is people put a check in the box because they sent the email or whatever, right? They published the article, they did the thing and they think they communicated and that their message got across. And that is rarely the case. Right. I, I, I can, I can confirm that in I, I, many of my own communications. I think one of the things that, you know, I've heard a great quote was, you know, the, the, the biggest misperception in communication is thinking that it ever really happened. <laughs> exactly. So as you think about all of that, like one of the things that I know that our, people in our professions um, often struggle with is like wanting to having to deliver a message in an auditable way, but 
the getting through part is not the part that gets measured. So what would you say to people who are telling you, look, you know, we're required to, to do this. How do you find that right blend? Well, I love to say that people don't want to read about policies, processes, and procedures. They want to read about other people. Um, so a way of doing this, right, is you can communicate about your policy or your process or your thing through a story about a person and what they did. And we could go on just a whole different tangent about storytelling and how that's more memorable and we're wired to, to engage with story. But I think there's this element of like, understanding another human and we're just drawn to read about people. So anytime we can frame our communication in that context, I think we're going to be so much better off, but you're right. I mean, a lot of us are measured for doing the thing, not seeing if the thing was really impactful. And that's where some of the measurement that you can put in place um, for either internal or external communication can be just so valuable. Um, companies are measuring like the basics of click throughs and open rates on emails or how much an intranet article gets read, for example, and really treating their employees like they treat their external stakeholders in terms of measuring marketing communication. And you can get a ton of feedback from that. And if you see that the numbers, right, the numbers don't lie. If you see that people aren't engaging with that content in some way, you know, you have a problem on your hands and a great way to figure out what's going on is to just go ask your end user, right? Like, did this meet the mark? Did it miss the mark? what, what did you take from this? What do you need from this? Um, I think that's a great way to do things. So my, my storytelling approach of, let me tell you a story about your colleague, Bob, who read his policy on time and signed off on it. And he didn't lose his job. Isn't sufficient. Sadly, no, Dan, I hate to tell you, I hate to break it to you. And by the way, that's definitely the easier thing to do. Right. And we're all so busy. It takes a lot of extra time and effort and planning to do this this approach that we're advocating yeah. for to be sure yeah storytelling is key especially as you move up in the chain in the chain of communications you know talking to board members it's all about story it's not about it's not necessarily about the hard underlying um you know metrics versus the versus the narrative so let me ask you um a different question as we are looking towards getting through to our audience how do you know what your audience wants and needs like i can guess what people might want to hear i can guess what might be important to them but what's a good way to kind of gauge that like audience mindset yeah i always recommend just go talk to them and again it takes extra work up front it takes extra time maybe extra money uh, but we can find so much out by just going to talk to them, right? Again, sometimes it's so obvious and it's not human nature. Um, but if we've got the ability to do that, I think that's just so valuable. Hey, this is what I think you need to hear and when you need to hear it and what you care about and what you need from me to be a successful. But actually just tell me what those things mean to you. And I, I, I think we're almost always going to be surprised by that, right? Because if we're not truly walking in those people's shoes, like we can't really know what's on their minds. You just have to engage with them in that way. So how, how can people overcome that fear of being told, oh, you should know this, you're the expert, when going to ask that question? Mm. Well, that's interesting, right? There's functional expertise, like I'm the expert at compliance, I'm the expert in, in data security or whatever the case may be. But we're not really the expert in like what the end user needs to know about it. In fact, we can be, I think, our own worst enemy on this stuff because we live and breathe it every day right. and we intimately understand these things. But there is a different lens and a different use case for those we're communicating to about it. So yeah, I, I fully understand and appreciate that little bit of fear and insecurity um, about like, oh, I don't want to be vulnerable and not be seen as the expert here. But I also think you know, when I'm out talking to employees for a variety of reasons across many organizations, I always say never underestimate the value of just asking them for their opinion. It usually means a lot to them. There are many folks, especially at the, on the front lines of organizations, right, that'll tell me like, gosh, this is the first time I've ever been asked my opinion about anything ever. And it really speaks volumes just to take the time to do that and have that be part of the culture. So that would be my guess, like my best sort of guidance on that um, is just kind of put the fear aside. 
Phenomenal answer. So as we're thinking about, you know, developing careers and everything else, I know one of the things that you did was you became an entrepreneur um, and, and, and went through a pandemic and everything else. As you think about those steps in your life, what has made a difference for you in terms of mentoring and connecting? Um, and what do you think people should think about if they're thinking about career changes? Mm. You know, I got some uh, networking advice early on in my, in my entrepreneurial career, which was don't go into a conversation with somebody assuming that you know what you're trying to get out of it or that you're there with an agenda. Just seek to meet interesting people with aligned values to yours and have interesting conversations and genuinely connect on a human level and magical things will happen on the business side. Mm. Um, right. And so I sort of am fundamentally opposed to kind of these like hyper efficient 20 minute networking meetings with a structure. And I say this and then you say that. And then I, you know, whatever, like that, just like robotic exchange. I've had the best, um, it, you know, interactions when we've had the time to truly connect. It is not the most efficient thing to do always. Right. But it's kind of that quality versus quantity approach. So I, I just, again, I really think like seek to connect with interesting people. Everyone is our teacher. We can learn something from everybody and just start there and see where that takes you. I feel like it's kind of a breadcrumb trail, right? You just never know where that's going to lead. I think we found in the pandemic that efficiency isn't always the right answer, you know, and it breaks down quite quickly whenever any kind of, you know, friction gets into the process. So this, you know, this supports that. Absolutely. So the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is obviously I, I know you, I know that you, beyond being an entrepreneur and an amazing um, colleague, friend, author, et cetera, you also have a family. How do you balance it all? And how do you make, you know, choices when it comes to well-being for yourself? Yeah, man, this is a work in progress for me. I vacillate between like all sides of the spectrum or the pendulum on this being healthy and not healthy. Um, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to grow and invest in your business, I don't know about for you guys, my business is always right here. It rides around on my shoulder 24 seven. We're on vacation. We're like, right. It does not matter. Um, and it just can be really tempting to just constantly feed that beast because it's always looking for more food. There's always more opportunity. There's always more of everything. Right. So when I am at my best, which is not all the time, I don't check, I know I don't have notifications on my phone. I do not check email after I decided to sign out for the night, whatever time that happens to be. I've really gotten better about, I do not consume any email in the morning until I'm actively physically ready to sit down at my desk. I'm not picking it up and looking at it. Uh, you know, first in thing bed. in the morning, yeah. it's that, you know, Marie Forleo says, create before you consume. I'm really trying to create something before I consume. I'm usually creating my kids getting out the door to school and being fed. I'm usually creating like writing in my journal and having my gratitude and my affirmations and my things that I do. I might not be creating a whole lot else, frankly, before I sit down to consume email and other things, but I'm just really trying to start to put some boundaries around that for my mental health. I think we all sort of know that feeling when we're just like riding on adrenaline and so jacked up because we're just like feeding that, feeding that in ourselves all the time. And I can feel when I get off course there. And I'm just really trying to kind of bring that back to center. But the, so the mental health aspect is one, but as an entrepreneur, like you said, it's always there. The, the ultimate responsibility for the organization is yours. That's a hard thing to shake off um, and say, I'm going to detach. What if something goes wrong? I mean, it's FOMO on a whole other scale in a whole other realm. Um, the conscious choices to stay away from it are great, but it's still, it, how do you, it's still got to be talking in your head. How are you, how are you, how are you able to place that in its right place? Uh, you know, I will not claim I have the answer on that. I, one thing I do, I'm one of those people that some nights I wake up and I'm awake for like three hours in the night. And I feel like I'm getting like a universal download. I'm actually getting a lot of helpful information, oh, yeah. but it's not helping me sleep. And I, you know, 
my husband would say like, don't pick up your phone in the night and start doing stuff. But I start putting that stuff in my notes, like get it out of here, get it down there. So I have a prayer of getting back to sleep, right? Just like documenting it or I'll lay awake worrying that I won't, you know, it won't come back in the morning and it's helpful stuff. I just don't have a great answer for that. It's just like trying to do the best you can, right? I have cycles where I like, I'm sleeping great and everything's really great. And then I just get off kilter sometimes. And I, I sort of get off track and I have to just keep returning, like just keep coming back to where I want to be. Yeah. And I would love, like, if you guys have advice too, please lay it on me. Cause I will never pretend to be an expert on this stuff. I go with a physical notebook because then I'm not inclined to dive into email in the middle of the night when that happens. Um, and then end up losing four more hours. Uh, <laughs> Um, because I'm, I am a slave to email. I'm, I'm a fully admit, hi, I'm Dan Ayala and I do too much email. And I <laughs> hate um, but, uh, but you know, there's that. Uh, and then also just the, you know, it, accepting that that is really part of being an entrepreneur and t- tempering it where we can. But I think what's most important about what you just said is that realization that give people can give themselves the grace to understand that it is a different world than being an employee, than being a, you know, you have different things to think about. And while it may not be perfect, it still is not, you are not a bad person, bad entrepreneur, because you let those things happen. Yes, I could not agree with that more. And I think it's a function of being a good entrepreneur to always have the ideas and always be thinking yeah. about the thing, you know, I mean, um, it's like, we care about these things so deeply. These are our businesses, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I look at it like the same as my babies, right? There are times where I am worried about one of my children and, and it's harder to sleep and we have, may have ideas about, okay, what's causing this or how do we find different solutions? I, I you know, my businesses are my other babies. So like, it's, uh, you know, for anybody who's a parent out there, like being an entrepreneur is a lot like being a parent. <laughs> and I want my business to be able to go to college. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. I, I often do call my businesses like my third and fourth children and yeah. they can be the favorite children because guess what? They're easier to control. And like, they're just easier to deal with on some days. And it can be so tempting for me instead of engaging with my kids, because that feels less productive, like sort of on paper, which, you know, um, it can be so easy to just go lean into my businesses and the things that I know need to get done for that. And I'm really trying to work on the most important stuff doesn't look like the most productive uh, right. In terms of crossing things off the to do list and returning the emails, it's the same in the business, right? Like having that time to think and marinate on things and dream instead of just being heads down doing like that doesn't look as productive, but my gosh, what could be more important and ultimately more, more productive for your business than spending time doing that. Yeah. So, yeah. You don't go to jail if you lock your, if you lock your business in the basement office and ignore it for three days. Well, one of the things that I know that you have also always said is sometimes the work that has to be done is not the one that has the greatest priority on it because you sometimes need to make it a priority if it's a long-term goal. And you talked about that a lot in the book that we wrote together because there were always things that would be bumping down, you know, the getting done, the long-term projects done. Um, So I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit about how you had to prioritize some of the work that wasn't instant gratification. Yeah, it's that, it's that urgent versus important Mm-hmm. And usually often, often those are not the same thing, right? The little technical menial things feel urgent because they're popping up, but those bigger strategies and thought processes or writing a book that doesn't have a hard deadline, but like we want this book to go out into the world. What would that mean to us? But my gosh, any given day, that is not the most urgent thing, though it's probably one of the most important. And so <laughs> I wish I could tell you that I'm just really good at reserving time to work on the important stuff honest truth, I have to make the important, the most urgent at some point for me to prioritize it and make it happen. So for example, with our book, we had times where we felt like we were kind of lagging behind what we where we wanted to be. And we just said, look, we are putting a hard deadline in place. And this now becomes the most urgent thing for tomorrow or for next week to work on. And like, I just had to like, let that bubble up to the top, beat that down, 
and then go on my way. Like, that's just kind of how I'm wired. I, oh, I hate saying that because right. We all have these dreams of meeting free Fridays and we just sit and think, and we do the like, oh my gosh, that's who I want to be, but it's not who I am today. Is it realistic? I mean, As an entrepreneur, is it realistic? Makes for a great marketing slick and recruiting memo, but is it realistic? I mean, I always say like, if Google can do it for their people, whatever their day is, like, I feel like I should probably be able to do it. I don't know. I don't know. Well, Steph, unfortunately, we're already to the end of our time. What a great discussion. Um, and we'll you know put links to 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 your businesses as well as to the book. Um, I have no problem saying buy their book. It's great. Um, and uh, and but in but before we go, we always ask our guests one final question, and that's what is the best advice you've ever received from a mentor? Yeah, I you know. Um, my first boss out of college, I worked for her for five and a half years, which is a very long time to work for a single boss. I've since learned. And, you know, I was young, had a lot of ideas. I kind of came in guns blazing and she really sort of gave me this advice of, yeah, you and I both kind of know the right answer here and where we're ultimately going to take people, but you can't just blast right through. Like you need to bring people along and earn credibility and respect and prove out your thinking and like take them by the hand and bring them on a journey. You can't take them from zero to 60. And it's such a great fundamental of change management, right? P how people experience change, how they need to process through the stages. You can't go from, you know, denial to like championing something like that's not how it works. You pass through all the phases in between. And that was just, especially at that point in my career, but even today, just such sage advice that I've often come back to. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Steph. We really appreciate you being here. Where can people find you? You know, I live on LinkedIn. So if you look for Steph Cheetah out on LinkedIn, that's a really great way to engage with me. And I've got business accounts out there too for both my businesses. So I'd recommend LinkedIn. Great. Well, we'll put links to those in the show notes too. And we thank you for being here, Steph. What a great discussion. And thank you so much for sharing all your insights. Thanks for having me, you guys. Sure thing. And thanks to you for being here and part of our community. Um, if you're interested in more information about MentorCore, come visit our website, mentorcore.biz. We have a Slack channel, building out a community of people to try and get to know each other, grab more great advice like this, um, and, uh, and just be part of a growing community of security, privacy, compliance, ethics, risk, and governance professionals. We also want your feedback, info at mentorcore.biz. You can email us. Uh, you can find all of our videos of past episodes that go back now two and a half years uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, you just search for MentorCore, or you can find all of our past episodes as well, along with information about all of our speakers and guests at mentorcore.biz. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you again on the next MentorCore.